If you and I know the way, why aren't we guiding people the way, the truth? And the way that they can have life and have it in abundance. To draw man back into ourselves, to draw them out of the hands of the enemy, to bring them back to your glory. Is there any other way? Song was my suegro's favorite song. He lo he loved that cross. You know, we have a cross in our backyard that Pastor Bill and it says John three sixteen. And he put a little bench by it so we could go out there and read our word or pray. And and sometimes in the morning when I was making the bed, I'd look out. My suegro would be just sitting there staring at the cross. And uh, and I went out one day and I told him, pues que tanto ves? He goes, es que, he tells me in Spanish, he goes, I, I, can't, I can't believe. I still, how do you say? He goes, no puedo creer que Jesús hizo lo que hizo por mí. I can't believe that Jesus did what he did for me. And oh man, it was just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's so beautiful when you can make it personal, you know? And if we, I think if we were the only ones, he still would have did it because he loves us. Amen. Okay. Hmm. Holy Spirit, I just surrender myself to you right now holy spirit i ask that you just anoint my lips that you speak through me holy spirit i am totally under your control i pray that you touch each and every person's mind and heart that they might be ready to hear and receive what you have for them protect the seeds that are going to be planted in them this evening i give you all the honor praise and glory in jesus name amen so i titled this message push push you know we live in a time where it seems like darkness is pushing us into a corner and we need to learn how to push back you know when i was a little girl i was talking to my suegra then i was reminding her i saw i because she told me it's a message and i'm like no i wasn't a pelionera there's a difference to be a pelionera and to defend yourself and and i used to defend myself when somebody would push me i would now i'm a pelionera okay now I am, but I would push myself because you know what? I was, they used to call me malnutrition in school. I was really, really skinny and I have big ears. So when I was really, really skinny, it looked like my ears were really, they would call me Dumbo. They would, yeah, they would call me buck teeth and then that I'll show you who's a John Dumbo, you know? And so they would call my daddy into the principal's office all the time. He said, no, 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 Mijita doesn't fight. She defends herself. But my body grew into my ears, and they're not, you know, it's like, a, <laughs> I'm going to grow into it, Dad. But, uh, but we have to learn to push back against the evil guys. You know, I've been, I've been hearing a lot of things on social media as far as, uh, well, you, you guys know that that movie, The Sound of Freedom, came out. How many of you guys went to see it? Oh, we went to see it. You guys have to go and see this movie. It's, a, it's, it's wow. It breaks your heart to really realize what's going on. And this is based on a true story. You know, but you realize how much darkness there is in the world and everything that's going on in our schools, everything that's just going on in our government. But I think we're at a point and a time in, in our Christian lives is that we have to learn how to push back. And I'm not saying being pelioneros, okay? I'm just saying we have to learn to push back. Because I think the darkness has come far enough already. And we have to get to a point where we say enough is enough, you know. You know, when, when, when a woman's in labor and you're about to give birth, what do they tell you? Push. Push. The only way a miracle is going to be born is when we push. So you want a miracle in your spiritual life, you need to learn how to push. We need to learn how to push, but we need to learn how to push according to how the Bible teaches us to push. So we're going to go, we're going to open up with Ephesians 6. I'm going to read the armor of God really quick, but we're going to focus on the last two verses. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 19. And you guys can write these down, study them later at home. I'm reading from the New King James. Finally, my brethren. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual host of wickedness and heavenly places. So therefore, take up the whole armor of God. This is a command. It's not a suggestion, guys. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. We are living in the evil day, guys. And having done all to stand, stand, therefore. Having girded your waist with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And these are the ones I want you to focus on. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You pray for each other. And for me, the, uh, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's what we did on Monday night. We opened our mouth boldly. And you know what? Let me tell you something. We got to one corner on Coors and Central. There was so much darkness. We got out of the vehicle and the darkness scattered. Huh? Everybody just started going different ways. We got off friendly. We offered water. Who wants water? Almost everybody got a water, but once they started preaching the word of God, they just scattered because darkness doesn't like light. But the ones who really wanted to hear the word, they stuck around. They stuck around and they heard the word. And, and it, it was just amazing. You know, the thing is, is you go, you go into your home. When you get home, it's probably already dark. And you don't get into your house and say, darkness, leave. Darkness, vamos para fuera, darkness. No, we turn on the light switch. And the darkness disappears, right? The darkness has to leave. So we have to make sure that we are purposing to stay in the Word of God, to learn the Word of God, to study the Word of God, so that when we're around darkness, our light shines brighter than the darkness. Let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. And the word of the Lord says, you therefore must, this is another commandment, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The day that you said yes to Jesus, you enlisted in his army, whether you believe it or not, you enlisted in his army. See, we are soldiers in the army of Jesus Christ and the soldier must train and study so that he will be prepared for the battle. If you don't study and train yourself up in the word of God and you go out in the streets, those demons are going to tear you to pieces. But when you, you, you go before a person who's, I mean, seriously, they're on meth, they're on fentanyl, they're on heroin, whatever, and, and, and that, that, that demonic spirit is all around, you walk up with the authority that you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You don't back down. You don't be afraid. Because if you're going to go into the streets afraid, let me tell you something. The wolves can always smell fear. They can smell fear. You can't be afraid when you go into the streets. Before a man is sent into war, he must first learn how to use his weapon. He is taught how to arm and disarm his weapon. He is taught how to dismantle his weapon. And he is taught how to put it back together with blindfolds on. He must become familiar with his weapon. He will be using that weapon to fight for his life. See, my dad used to tell me this because my dad was in the military. And uh, he, had, he had his group that he was in charge of, and he used to carry a special, a special rifle. It was a 22 250 semi-automatic, which I had for a while. But... Uh, and they used to blindfold them, and they used to make them take their weapon apart, blindfold it, and, 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 and memorize every part of the weapon, 
and then blindfolded, they had to arm it back again. They had to load it, and they had to shoot. They had to become that familiar with their weapon because when they were out there in the field and the enemy was shooting at them, they didn't have time to wonder, well, where do you take off the safety and where do you? No, they, they had to be quick because that weapon was going to help them preserve their life. They were going to save their life. They had to have an intimate relationship with their weapon. They had to know it in and out. They had to be able to, whether they fell in a ditch and their eyes were full of mud, they had to be able to get those bullets, load them with the gun, and know where they were going to shoot, know exactly how to use that weapon. The Bible is the same thing to us, guys. The Bible is our weapon, and if we don't begin to build an intimate relationship with the word of God and know it inside and out and know how to disarm the evil one and know how even even blindfolded because sometimes we're going through storms so hard in our life especially when it comes to our children that you're blindfolded with hurt and pain so you have to be able to even through the hurt and the pain know how to use this powerful weapon that you have in your hands you know, and, and my dad told me because they trained us to do this, it not only saved my life many times, but I was able to save the life of many men around me because I had that intimate relationship with my rifle. I knew how to load it with my eyes closed. He knew, he, I mean, he knew it, even even with his eyes closed or blindfolded. And, and so this is what we have to be able to, when we're in a storm and we feel like we're blindfolded, we have to have enough of the word in us to carry us through, guys, to help us push, to push, so that that miracle of our children being saved comes to pass. So And push so that miracle in our, the lives of our grandchildren comes to to pass but we are what is standing between our children and our grandchildren and evil so we have to learn to push so that we can literally save their lives because see it's not a matter of them just dying it's a matter of where are they going to spend eternity if they die without salvation that's an awful thing you know pastor took me target practicing last week and uh and he told me the same thing he told me it doesn't do us to have it doesn't do us any good to have all these weapons, babe, if you know how to use them. So he took me way up there. Oh, now it seems like we drove for three hours. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he took me way up there. We took all our weapons, all the bullets, all, everything. We had everything. He made a, a target and everything. And he said, Look, babe. He said, As your husband, it's my responsibility to teach you how to use these weapons. Because if somebody breaks into the house in the middle of the night, what are you going to do? Hit them over the head with the gun? They're going to take it and shoot you. you. You have to know how to use those weapons. So he took me up there and he made me load it by myself. And, and I couldn't cock it by myself because we forgot I'm still healing. I wasn't even supposed to be using this arm. I didn't tell my doctor that today. I went back today for a checkup and it's looking good and stuff. But, but uh yeah, I when I was using that shotgun, he told me, babe, just shoot it like Rambo, okay? And and I, I hit that bullseye like six times. I did it pretty good. And he's like, I'm not going to make you mad anymore. <laughs> but but see, and, and that's the thing. As the leader of our home and as my husband and my pastor, he's responsible to teach me how to defend myself against physical and spiritual enemies. And if he doesn't teach me that, God's going to hold him accountable. And, and it's just the same when you're fighting spiritual. You have to know how many bullets you have. This is your weapon. But the verses, the word of God inside, those are your bullets. It would have done us no good to go up there to the mesas and have a target and have all the rifles and the guns and no bullets. We're just going to stand there like, what? you know, throw, throw the rifle at the target? Or, no, it does you no good. So you have to make sure that you have your pocket full of spiritual bullets all the time. So that anything that comes up against you, you get that phone call in the middle of the night. We all have got those phone calls that we dread in the middle of the night. Somebody just passed away. So you go into your arsenal of weapons and you start encouraging yourself. Start lifting yourself up. You start calling family members and praying for them. You start being a light in a dark moment. You know how many times 
in the past that have been shunned by family members like yeah. yeah okay yeah ready whatever that's for you not for us yeah okay yeah but then somebody dies suddenly or there's a tragedy in the family my phone rings hey can you pray for us see when people find themselves in total darkness they're going to reach out for a flashlight they're going to need that light and you better have enough bullets to share with everybody because when the times get hard you guys we have to learn to push we have to learn to push. Why do we push? You know why we're going to push? Because we're pushing for the life, the eternal life of our son, of our daughter, of our grandchild, for our, for our spouse. We're pushing through. We're pushing through. It might seem impossible, but we're pushing through. You know, and, and uh, last night we went over to Phil and Juanita. They invited us over for dinner. And my husband showed them the videos that I asked not to show anybody. He's like, my wife, she looks like Rambo. <laughs> He's like, my dad would have been proud of you, you know. But I was looking at him like, really? You said you weren't going to show anybody that. But, but you know, he, he can take pride in knowing that as my husband and the leader of our home, he showing me how to defend myself, not only physically but spiritually, and not only me. Because when they go out of town, him and Jose, I'm there alone with mom. I'm responsible for looking out for her too. So, you know, somebody comes into our house uninvited. I'm sorry, but I pray you know Jesus, you know. And, and, and it's just that's a way we have to fill with the enemy. You know what? It, the enemy even tries to come into my house. The enemy tries to get a hold of my children. You know what? You, you have me to deal with. And let me tell you something. You should, your purpose every day. Every day should be that all the angels in heaven know your name and all the demons in hell fear your name. Throw your shopos under the bed so when you get up in the morning, you have to get on your knees to get them because you should start your day with prayer and you should end your day with prayer. You walk out that door and if you haven't prayed up, you walk out there totally naked. Good luck. Good luck. We have the most powerful weapon in the universe, but very few Christians know how to truly use it. The word of God is our weapon, and prayer is the ammo that we need to defend ourselves against the attacks of evil. We live in a world that has been polluted by the filth of perversion, and evil is pushing hard against the church. But we, the Christians... We as soldiers in the army of Jesus Christ need to push back and we need to push harder than what the enemy is pushing. We need to push hard. What do I mean by push? I'm not telling you guys again, go be perioneros and if your bosses tell you you can't talk about God and work, then push them. No, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you that. Let me tell you what I mean. I made you guys a little poster. Push. Push. Pray until something happens. Pray, 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 pray. And don't give up. I prayed for my son for 10 years until he gave his life to Jesus Christ. I prayed for pastor for seven years and I didn't stop until he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Pray, push, push, pray until something happens. Don't just say, well, oh, I prayed last week and nothing happened. Every day you got to push. You know, I tell the doctor, he's like, push, the baby's almost here. Oh, I pushed a minute ago, doctor. I mean, no, we push and it hurts to push. It hurts. You have pain. But then when the doctor comes and puts this little miracle in your arms, you don't remember that pain anymore. And when we get to heaven, we're not going to remember this pain anymore. All former things are going to be forgotten. And God himself is going to wipe the tears out of our eyes. Because now it might seem like it's hard. It's hard to push back. The pain is too much. It's hard to see my son and daughter out in the street. It's hard to see my spouse without a relationship, without salvation. We worry about them. What if they die tomorrow? But we continue to push. You push until that miracle is born. You push. And then you give it a name. Glory to God. 
Don't ever take God's credit. It's all about God. But we have to continue to push until that miracle is born. For seven years, eight years, I prayed for pastor's brother. I didn't know why God had me praying for him. At that time, honestly, I didn't like him. He was a mean alcoholic. We had some words, and I was like, when the Lord told me, pray for Julio, I'm like, and I started, oh, Lord, bless Julio, you know, like, whatever, you know, whatever. Lord, please don't let a truck hit Julio, you know, kind of like just. But when the Lord caught my attention and said, I asked you to pray for him. Pray, not murmur a couple of things, pray, push through spiritually for him. Then I really began to, began to get on my knees for him. And on the day that my husband was going to commit suicide, it was Julio that called him and said, bro, I was at work and I was thinking about you and I just called you to let you know I love you and that God loves you. I'm going to get baptized tonight. It would be an honor if you would be there. So he put the gun away and didn't commit suicide that night. Eight years of praying. I didn't know why God had me praying for Julio. But God knew that the day that my husband was going to pull the trigger on his head, that Julio was going to call. He was going to use that bank account that I had of prayers. And I withdrew from my account of prayers. And it saved my husband's life that day. See, don't get tired of praying. Sometimes we're like, it's no use. There's no change. That's what I used to think with my son. I used to say, God, I pray, I fast, I fast, I pray, I fast, and nothing's happening. But the Lord would assure me when my son would call me and say, Mom, I'm in my car. I'm parked somewhere in a field or the bosque. I have a gun to my head, Mom. I'm going to pull the trigger. I'm going to let you hear. I'm going to kill myself, Mom, and it's your fault. And I would freeze. I would freeze with fear, holding my phone, and the tears would just come down. And, and, and my husband would tell me, well, what's the matter, babe? And I would tell him, it's my heat again. He's going to kill himself. He's not, babe. He's not. Let's pray. And we would pray, and we would pray. And my son would hang up the phone. And all night, I didn't know if my son was laying somewhere with a bullet in his head. If I was going to get that phone call in the middle of the night or the cops were going to come knocking on my door and let me know they found my son dead in the bosque or somewhere, I didn't know. It was torture all night. I didn't know if he was dead or alive until the next time I heard from him. Ten years. But I continued to push through with prayer. And I saw a miracle after ten years. My son gave his life to the Lord. He married his girlfriend because they were living in sin. He got baptized. Pastor had the honor of not only leading him to the Lord, but baptizing him and marrying him and his girlfriend. Ten years of pushing through and pushing through and pushing through. And when the enemy would come in the middle of the night and laugh and say, your son's dead, your son's dead. I would have to say, no, he's not dead. He's going to live. He's going to live because I'm holding on to this promise. And God is not a man that he should lie. And I would start quoting my bullets from the Bible, my promises, my scriptures. I would start quoting them until the enemy fled my house. Because, see, he can't stand against it is written. Because he tried with Jesus in the wilderness. And it didn't work for him. And it didn't work for me. I'm not going to tell you that as a mother that I didn't feel fear sometime or, man, I felt like somebody was ripping my heart out of my chest when I would get those phone calls. But I had to continue to hold on to the promises of God, and that would get me through. So we pray until something happens. We push until something happens. You can have every version of the Bible in your home. You can study it until you're blue in the face. But you don't know, if you don't know how to pray, when the storms come and times get tough, you're going down. Because many times, as soon as a storm comes, what do we do? We run to social media. We run to the phone where we should be falling on our face before the throne of God. It's okay to call and ask for prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. But we first have to acknowledge God that he is in control of everything. 
You know, I have Bibles in Hebrew and Greek and Latin and every version you could think of. Because I hit up estate sales and I buy every Bible I could find. Oh gosh, Pastor, so patient. I have three bookshelves of Bibles. Bibles, women's Bibles, men's Bibles. You just, I have Bibles. And I love Bibles, but I get them. I'll have two or three at the table at the time with my concordance. And I'm studying and, and I'm just learning. And I'm not studying Greek and Arabic and all of these so I can come up here and, and act like I know everything. No, I am studying this because I want to find the heart of God for me, for my children, for my family, for you guys. When something happens with you guys and Pastor and I are in prayer for you, I want to know that I have enough bullets to load my gun and protect you guys. Because as your shepherds and your pastors, that's what we're supposed to do, is make sure that our spiritual weapons are loaded at all times, that we have our armor of God on, and that we're ready for battle no matter what may come. And as pastors, we get too many phone calls in the middle of the night. Somebody just died. Somebody just passed the stop sign, Pastor, and my son's dead. Pastor, my daughter just committed suicide. Pastor, we just found my daughter hanging in her closet. She killed herself. We get too many of those phone calls. And you know what? If we're not staying in the Word of God, if we're not staying in prayer, if we're not staying in fasting, man, that, that could really bring us down. But we have to continue to build ourselves up in the Lord so when these things happen, we're ready to go out there and share and push and stand against that darkness and against the doubt that comes into the minds of the people. Because the first thing that goes through the mind of a parent that just lost a child to suicide is God doesn't exist. My sister's buried four of her children. She only has two left. And with the, with the third one, she told me, God doesn't exist. I don't believe God exists because why? Did he give me children to take them? And we had long conversations. And I went to Milan and I spent time with her, ministered to her, prayed with her. And I just continued to, just to share the love of God with her. I was always there for her. No matter what time she called me, I just continued to share the love of God with her. And when she lost her fourth son, she said, you need to stand behind me when I'm burying my son because I don't know if I could do it. Can you ask the Holy Spirit to give me strength? And I was standing behind my sister with my arms on her shoulders and I was saying, Holy Spirit, fill her with strength, fill her with strength, fill her with strength. And after the funeral, when they were putting the dirt over his coffin, that was the first time and the first child that she didn't break down to because the last ones she wanted to throw herself in, just bury me with my children. But she said, thank you, the Holy Spirit gave me the strength. This is what you study for. This is what you learn for. This is what you armor up for, not only for yourself, but for you can be a strength for a person that at a moment like that doesn't have strength. It was like the friends that carried the, that man that was paralyzed up into the roof because there was no way to get to Jesus because there were so many people, the door was blocked. But they were good friends. They carried him up onto the roof. They tore the roof and they lowered him down to Jesus. This is what we have to do sometimes when people are hurting. We have to tear that spiritual roof and lower them into the hands of Jesus Christ. But we have to have enough in us to be able to hold them up. Do you have enough of the word inside of you to hold somebody up at a time like that? Because it's hard. There is a spiritual power and a spiritual strength that a prayer warrior has that makes the enemy tremble. When you're a prayer warrior and you wake up in the morning you know, there's, there's the demon say, I see them. Yeah, she got up again. You know, we're, we're about to get whooped. And that's how it should be. But sometimes we get up in the morning, oh, it's Monday. God made the sun to rise on Monday just like he made it to raise on Friday. Let's praise the Lord that we just have another day of life. It doesn't matter if it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It doesn't matter if you're having a tooth a root canal on your tooth. It, it's another day of life that we can praise the Lord, minister to the dentist. 
You know, we have to arm ourselves up, guys. When we learn how to push, pray until something happens, we can walk through a landmine and not fear. When our prayer life is weak, you are weak. If your prayer life is weak, you are weak. Thoughts of giving up, thoughts of suicide, thoughts of defeat are always going to follow you. Because see, a wolf can always, always, or even a lion or a bear can always sniff out the weakest one in a herd. And they'll go for that one. So if your prayer life is weak, guys, so is your spiritual life. And the enemy knows it. Do we need to kneel down to pray? Somebody asked me that question. We don't have to kneel down to pray all the time, right? God hears me no matter where. Yeah, he does. He does. I pray in my car. You know, sometimes I turn to the left and there's somebody looking at me like she's not even on the phone. <laughs> she's just talking to herself. That was the one good thing about the mask. No, nobody could see when you were talking to yourself. But, but that's okay. I didn't care if people thought I was crazy when I was in the world. I don't care if they think I'm crazy now. Yeah, I'm talking to my steering wheel, you know. But I'm constantly praying. The Lord brings somebody to my mind, and, and Lord bless them, protect them, be with them, whatever's going on. And, and, and it's just constant. If I'm at Sam's Club, I'm going through every aisle, and somebody comes to mind, I'm praying. I'm praying. That's what it means to pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean that I kneel down in the middle of Sam's Club and, you know, make a show for everybody. No. No, you know, I like think security, <laughs> they would get me out real quick. But let me tell you something. In the times where you're praying for a massive breakthrough in life, the life of a loved one, and you are in need of a supernatural miracle, yes, I believe that we should kneel in reverence of a holy God that we serve. We surrender. Exactly. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, if, if my, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and I will heal their land. It's not only heal the land of the United States or heal the land of your backyard. Your land are your children. They're your seeds. They're your land. He'll heal them. But word says here, if, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, humble themselves. When you go before a king or a queen, what do you do? Bow. When you go before a holy God and you really need a supernatural move in your life, a miracle, you bow, you bow down, you put your face to the ground and you remember that you are speaking to the holy of the holiest. That you're speaking to the creator of all the universe, of the heavens and the earth. You're, you're speaking to that creator. He's your father. But you come before him in reverence with reverence and thanksgiving, but you bow before him. That's what it means to humble yourself. It takes a lot. It takes a lot, especially people that have pride, to just get on their knees and humble themselves before God. Put their face down and say, I am not even worthy of looking at your face. If it was not for Jesus Christ, I'd probably drop dead right now, just like the people did of old. You know, when they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, they had to carry it with sticks. Because those who touched, even accidentally touched the Ark of the Covenant, dropped dead. Because he is such a holy God that sin could not touch that holiness. But now our holiness is the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? So we have to humble ourselves, guys. Humble ourselves and bow before him. Seek his face. But turn from your evil ways. If there's anything in your life, anything that you're struggling with, and you ask the Holy Spirit, reveal to me, Holy Spirit, if there's anything. Before I go to bed at night, I ask the Holy Spirit, if I said or did anything to disrespect you today or disrespect anybody, please reveal it to me so I can repent and ask for forgiveness because I don't want to die in my sleep and die with unforgiveness in my heart. That scares me. 
That scares me. Because Jesus said, if we don't forgive, neither will his father forgive us. So the two main objectives of the verse is humble and pray. If my people will humble themselves and pray. Humble and pray. Kneel before a holy God. Bring your petition. And remember that you're speaking to a holy God. For me, it's Abba, Father. Because to me, that's very personal. When I'm asking, when I'm praying. And many times when I fall on my face, it's amazing because time just goes. I remember one day last year sometime, it was during COVID, and I remember just kneeling in the middle of the kitchen because I was doing dishes, I was praying, I was in worship, and all of a sudden I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit so strong in my little kitchen. I just fell to my knees and I put my face on the ground and I, and I didn't even want to look up. It was such a holy moment. And I thought, if I even move, I'm going to die. It was, it, there was such a power. But I knew that I was before the presence of a holy God. And I didn't say nothing. I just listened. I just listened. Lord, what are you telling me? And I just listened. And then after a while, I began to pray in tongues. And then I began to worship. And I began to weep. This was like 7 o'clock in the morning. When I opened my eyes, it was 12.30, and it seemed like I had been down there for 10 minutes. Because you lose track of time when you're in his presence. It's a beautiful thing. So see, the two main objectives in this verse is humble and pray. It doesn't say, if my people which are called by my name go to seminary, or if my people which are called by my name have revivals or the people that call by my name have bible studies or feed the homeless or etc whatever whatever no it's if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray those are the two things humble yourselves and pray and seek his face not his hand it's not always gimme 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 it's just seek his face and love on him See, all those things are good and they're needed like we went out on monday all those things are good and needed but that doesn't make, oh, Lord, I've had the homeless today, so I don't have to pray for the rest of the week. I'm good. No. <laughs> no, you're not good. You put yourself in a dangerous place. So all those things are good and needed. But first, you must learn to push. Pray until something happens. Pray until something happens. We had a young man in here, demon-possessed, on fentanyl, suicidal. He didn't want to accept Jesus that day. He wasn't finished with his addiction. And what did Pastor and I do? We kept pushing in prayer. We kept in contact with his parents. How is he doing? How is he doing? We're praying for him. We're praying for him. She would text me at 2 in the morning, pray for him. He's on the streets, pray for him. And somebody's looking to pray for him. The police are looking for a pray for him. We just kept pushing in prayer, pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And we got a report about three weeks ago. And we kept, our prayer was, Lord, Give him visions of hell and bring him down to his face and break him and do whatever you have to do. Whatever you have to do to bring this young man to his knees and to realize that he needs you. You know what it took? It took somebody carjacking him, taking him up to a mesa's, totally stripping him naked, making him kneel down and putting a gun to the back of his head. And all of a sudden, he said something happened. They all got in his car and drove away. And didn't kill him. Something scared him off. I truly believe they saw an angel that we had been praying to surround this young man. And they left in fear. They might have left him stripped down naked. But they didn't put a bullet in his head. Because we were pushing a prayer for this young man. And we believed. He went into rehab. He gave his life to Jesus. And he's doing better. That's you have to push. You have to push if you want that miracle. See, in everything that we do for the Lord, those things are good, but nothing compares to praying until something happens. Become familiar with your weapons of warfare. Become familiar with them. Memorize the Bible. 
So when you meet somebody at the store that, that tells you, you know what, I was going to commit suicide today, you have the, you have the weapons to share with him. You have the, the, the word of peace. You have the word of love. You have the word of salvation to share with that person. You're not, oh, well, you know what, let me call my pastor. Hey, pastor, can you give me some scriptures? No. You have to have it in your heart. See, the thing is, this is an example of men in the Bible that prayed and things happened. Abraham, Abraham pushed through in prayer. And right before he was to sacrifice his son, God sent an angel to Abraham, stop, stop. Now I know that you fear me. Daniel, he was a man of prayer. The only thing that they could accuse Daniel of was opening the window three times a day and praying to his God. For they were not to be praying to any other God for the time that the king had set apart. But Daniel kept pushing through in prayer. And what happened? God sent an angel to shut the mouth of the lions. The three Hebrew boys. They were mentored by Daniel. They were prayer warriors. And I believe that as they were being thrown into the fire, they were praying and saying, God, your will, not ours. Praise God, if we live for you or we die for you, all glory to you. And what happened? King Nebuchadnezzar looked in the fire and said, didn't we throw three men in there? There's four. And the fourth one looks like the son of God. And he called them out and they walked out of the fire. Just like, okay, <laughs> our God did it. But can you imagine the testimony these three boys had? Everybody was watching. And they walked out of fire and they didn't even smell like smoke. But all their young youth, their life, they were pushing through a prayer. Why? Because they were captives in Babylon. And they were praying for God to do a miracle in their life. Esther. Esther saved her people because she pushed through in prayer. What's the first thing she did? When her uncle told her, Esther, if you don't pray and you don't go before the king, don't be confused, little girl. Don't be confused. You think that you're not going to die along with us? But God's going to raise somebody else to save his people. And she said, okay, tell the people, let's fast and pray for three days. Let's push through in prayer. Let's fast. And then I will go before the king. And if I perish, I perish. Paul. Do you know how many of the scriptures Paul wrote while he was in prison in chains? He was chained to Roman soldiers. He couldn't even go to the bathroom without a Roman soldier or to the hole in the floor or whatever it was. But he pushed through in prayer. You see him pushing through in prayer. He says at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I have ran the race. Like I'm going home for my prize. That's what we have to look forward to. You know, I had, I had lunch with Mary Kay, and she's from uh, the Christian television station, 32. We had lunch yesterday. And we were just talking about the Lord, and she says, you know, I'm so excited because we're in the last days. The churches are going to begin to get persecuted. They're going to start taxing us. We've already got letters from the government. We're going to be taxed on our satellites and everything. But I'm excited because this is the last days. We're frontline soldiers. We're just all excited. We're there talking and everything. And, and then some girl that was sitting across the table, she came and she stood up. And we thought she was just leaving. She came to our table. And she said, I'm sorry, I wasn't eavesdropping, but I heard everything you guys were saying. She said, thank you for what you guys do. Thank you for what you guys do to reach people for God. And she gave us her business card. And she said, if you ever need help finding real estate, call me. And I told her, we're praying for a church. I'm going to call you so you can help us find one. And we were talking about the Lord, and we were talking, we were talking, we were talking, just praying and laughing and crying and giving each other testimony. And then all of a sudden, we look around, and there's like nobody in the restaurant. Even the waitresses are gone except for ours. All the chairs are on top of the tables. It's 3 o'clock. They closed at 2. And they didn't even ask us to leave. They left us there, and we got up, and then... We tell the waitress, can, can you bring the bill? We're sorry. We didn't know you guys were closed. And she goes, no, that lady took care of it. She was so moved when you guys held hands and prayed over your meal that she, prayed, she paid for your meal. See, people notice. People notice what you're talking about. 
people, you can be in a restaurant, and if you're there at your table and you're gossiping, or did you see this person? You're gossiping about somebody at work or somebody at church, and I can't believe they said that. I can't believe it. But then you're trying to represent Jesus Christ, and they're like, look at those hypocrites. People are listening. People are watching. We have to be careful what we do and what we say. And then Jesus, there's so many prayers so many places in the Bible where Jesus got up early before even the sun came out and went away to get in prayer to his father. Being God in the flesh, he felt it necessary to pray on a daily basis. We have to be prideful to think that we can get away a day without praying. If Jesus himself had to pray, to keep the evil one away from him, to keep away from temptation, to keep from sinning so that he would be worthy to go to that cross as the perfect spotless lamb of God. We have to stay in prayer. He is our example. And even King David, David's prayers, he was a man after God's own heart. David cried out to the Lord in every area of his life. Through the emotion, he found comfort in his Father in heaven. Below are some of the most powerful prayers that David prayed to God. In Psalm 60, he prayed for favor. In Psalms 51, he prayed the prayer of repentance. In Psalms 43, he prayed for help in his times of trouble. In Psalms 57, he prayed for safety from his enemies. In Psalm 86, he prayed for mercy. In Psalms 39, he prayed for wisdom and forgiveness. He prayed for prayer and instruction and guidance in 2 Samuel 23, 2. He inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack the Philistines, Lord? And the Lord answer, answered him and said, Go, David, attack the Philistines. And in 2 Samuel 2, 1, in the course of time, David inquired of the Lord and said, Shall I go up to the towns of Judah, Lord? And he, and he answered, The Lord said, Go up, David. Where shall I go, David asked, and he said to Hebron, the Lord answered. To have a close relationship with God so much, Lord, should I go to Sam's Club today, Lord? Yes, I'm going to clear the road for you. Everything's going to be okay. You're going to get back home safe. Lord, should I buy this new car? Is this in your will, or is this just the lust of my eye? Because I really can't afford it right now, Lord, but I really want it because my neighbor got it. You know, we have to be careful about that, guys, because the Lord says in his word to not be a slave to anyone. And when we owe so much money, we are slaves. We're slaves. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that Pastor and I, are out of debt. We're out of debt. I don't work because I take care of my mother-in-law. He works a full-time job. We don't get paid from the church. We have every penny that comes in here. We have written down, accounted for, where it comes in, what it goes to. We don't touch a penny of that. We don't take a salary. But because we have tithed since the day he gave his life to the Lord, we tithe. God has blessed us. And he has expanded our resources, our finances to reach, to be enough to pay for everything. And not only that, we help our mother-in-law. My mother-in-law, we help her with her bills, with her property taxes, with medications, with things that she needs. And, and the Lord stretches our finances to be able to help her and for our needs. But why? Because we don't rely on our finances. We don't say, oh, no, God, no, God. If we give you this, I'm not going to have enough for this. So then we don't trust in him. We don't believe in his power. The streets of heaven are paved in gold. What do you think God needs from you? Gold right now is at $1,986 an ounce. But it's construction material in heaven. What do you think God needs from you? He will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus owns everything. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In the book of Malachi, in Malachi God says, return to me. Not give me. You don't give him. You return to him what he asks of you. And he provides all. Even when you're praying. When you're praying and you're pushing through. 
through prayer. He's going to see she's honoring me. He's honoring me in everything that I have commanded. So there's now no bondage holding down from me, opening up the windows of heaven and just pouring blessings. We were telling Phil and Juanita last night, and I'm going to close with this. We were telling them last night when we were at the church downtown, you know, I had my other little tiny white car that had like 860,000 miles on it because I was using it for the church and for everything. And I was always, and I would come from Sam's Club to the church and he would look in the car like, where are you? You know, I was like packed. I couldn't even look out the windows. He said, babe, you need a bigger vehicle. Your vehicle is going to give out on you. Let's go buy you an SUV so that you can be safe and you can, you know, go shopping and, and have room. And he said, you know, I'm concerned. This little car is like, it's on its last leg. And I told him, you know, we're remodeling the church right now. So the finances we need for the remodel, let's pray and ask God to give us a car. And he's like, okay, let's pray and ask God to give us a car. We prayed, and this was on Wednesday. We prayed, and we said, Lord, we really need a vehicle for the church service. We need it so that we can run the errands, and we need it. You know, we really need a church vehicle, Lord, so that we can do what we have to do. And we would pick up some of the homeless. Sometimes when it was really cold in the winter, we were out there in the streets at 4 in the morning serving hot chocolate so that these people wouldn't freeze to death, opening up the church that they could come in so they wouldn't freeze to death. Mr. and Mrs. Gonzalez, remember downtown when we used to feed all the homeless and, and stuff. Anyways, on Wednesday, we prayed and we said, God, we need this vehicle. And we said, it, it's your ministry, Lord. You need to provide us a vehicle. And that next Thursday morning, not that day, a week after that Thursday morning, we had a couple call and say, hey, we we're just wondering if you guys could use a Suburban for the church. We'd like to donate one. They donate the Suburban, they have put new tires on it, they filled the tank, and they gave us a check for $500 so we could register it and get insurance. But when you truly believe in God for something, but you're being faithful, it's like going to the bank. You have a savings account. And you might just have $5 at the end of the month, but you're putting in your savings account, you know, for that rainy day. That's what, the, that's what your faithfulness to God is. You're not, you're not losing anything. You're not giving us anything. You're showing God, I totally trust you. I'm putting in my spiritual saving account. I'm putting in my spiritual saving account. And then when you need it. But see, if you go to the bank now and you say, I, I, you know, I need to withdraw a million dollars from my check account. They just sit there and laugh at you like you have $3.36. You can't get a million dollars. But sometimes we want these big supernatural things from God, but we haven't sold anything. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about faithfulness. Do you trust him? Obedience is better than sacrifice. That's the kind of bank account I'm talking about. Are you obeying him? Are you being the light? Are you being the salt? Because the light shines on the word of God so the world can see it. But the salt preserves it. It preserves the word of God in your heart so that you can have it to share with other people. And that's what I mean about push. It's just pray until something happens. I would write that on a piece of paper and hang it on your refrigerator and look at it every day. And say, I'm going to pray until something happens. And I'm going to pray until something happens. And trust God that he is able because he is able. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word that's truth. We thank you for your faithfulness, Heavenly Father. We thank you that nothing takes you by surprise, Lord. Your word says, Heavenly Father, that all our days are written in your book. You knew the moment we were going to take our first breath, and you know the moment we're going to take our last, Lord. You're already there. So everything in between, Heavenly Father, should be done for your glory. We ask that you continue to teach us how to push forth and how to push back when the enemy comes against our family, Lord. We have to stand in the gap, and we have to push with all of our might, saying you're not going to have my spouse, you're not going to have my children. You're not going to have my grandchildren. And we have to stand firm in your armor and, and believe in faith that you are able to help us. That your mighty, righteous right hand upholds us in these times, Heavenly Father. 
that just like when King David went out to battle Heavenly Father, you went before him. And you defeated the enemies before they even raised a hand, Lord. You did it then and you can do it now, Lord. We trust in you completely. But we're living in such darkness, Heavenly Father. We can see it all around us. Sometimes we get discouraged, Heavenly Father. And I ask that you continue to give us the strength, Heavenly Father, that we need to continue to push through. To push through for our children, our grandchildren, our family members, our siblings. To push through in prayer and say, I'm not going to stop praying no matter how discouraged I feel. No matter how tired I am. Even if I don't see a change and I'm just getting discouraged, Heavenly Father, continue to teach us to push through, Heavenly Father. To pray without ceasing. To seek your face on a daily basis. But always do it with reverence and fear. Remembering that you are a holy God. We thank you, Lord, that for your son, Jesus Christ, and him crucified on that cross, and that blood that he shed, that veil was torn. And we can come boldly before your throne as your children, Heavenly Father, and we can lift up our petitions. Not our wants, not all of our selfish desires, but our petitions for the salvation of our family, Heavenly Father, the salvation of our government, the salvation of this nation, the leaders of the world, Heavenly Father, help us to not grow bitterness in our heart, but to pray for them. They're lost in darkness. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word that's true. We thank you that it is our armor. It is our weapon, and, and it's full of bullets for us to use. Holy Spirit, teach us how to use them. Teach us how to write your word on the tablet of our heart, that we might not sin against you that we can have a hope to give to the world. Thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I thank you for my husband. I ask that you bless him, Lord, and surround him with angels to protect him always. That you send godly men to surround him. Godly men who will stand by his side and encourage him and lift him up when he's down, Lord. I pray that the Holy Spirit will always come and minister to him, Lord. When the enemy tries to bring doubt. Lord, I ask that you rekindle that fire in his heart and his soul to continue to reach men, Heavenly Father. This world is falling apart because men have not taken their leadership in the homes. Help my husband to continue doing that, Heavenly Father. We pray in advance right now for the soldiers of the cross conference. Lord, we ask that you prepare the hearts of the men, Heavenly Father. As we till the ground, Heavenly Father, and pour the seeds, that you will bring the rain, Lord, and there will be a full harvest. We thank you for this evening. I thank you for each and every person here, Lord. I ask that you bless them abundantly, that you protect them and get them home safely, Lord, that you give them sweet sleep. Send angels to minister to them as they sleep, Heavenly Father, that they will feel safe and secure in your arms. And tomorrow they will wake up ready for this battle again, Heavenly Father. Help us to never go grow weary, Heavenly Father, but give us wings like eagles, Lord, that we might soar and continue, Heavenly Father, to be an example to your glory and your greatness. So I just thank you as we close this service, Heavenly Father, and we go our separate ways. I ask that you protect each and every person, Heavenly Father, that we might meet here again soon, Lord, as a family. We love you and we bless you. We bless your holy name. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, thank you for taking our place on the cross. We bless you. We worship you and we reverence your name. It's in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. Out. What an amazing opportunity. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. Right now. You have a church. I, or you don't have a home church. Get plugged into your home church, wherever you may be. If you're in the Albuquerque, New Mexico area, we would love to have you. Uh, join us for worship here at Majesty Worship Center. Our address is as follows, 3250 Coors Boulevard, Northwest, Suite B, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87121. We would love to meet you. We would love to, to fellowship with you. So I just pray that you would get plugged into the house of God. God bless you, and thank you for watching.